about the arterial supply of the gastrointestinal tract. You know that the gastrointestinal tract is divided into three parts, foregut, midgut, and hindgut. Each part has its specific artery that supplies it. The foregut is supplied by the celiac trunk or celiac artery. The midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery the hind gut is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. Again, we have three parts of the gut, foregut, midgut, and hind gut. The foregut extends from the lower third of the esophagus till the biliary orifice at the major duodenal papilla in the second part of the duodenum, in the middle of the second part of the duodenum. The midgut terminates or ends at the junction of the right two thirds and the left one third of the transverse colon, and the hind gut terminates at the junction between the upper half and the lower half of the inner canal. The foregut is supplied by celiac artery which arises from the front of the abdominal aorta at the level of the upper border of L1. The midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, which arises from the front of the abdominal aorta at the level of the lower border of L1. And the midgut is supplied by <coughs> the inferior mesenteric artery, which also arises from the front of the abdominal aorta at the level of L3. Therefore, the duodenum, which develops from the foregut and the midgut, is supplied by two arteries. The upper half is supplied by the celiac artery, and the lower half is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. Same for the transverse colon. The transverse colon is developed from the midgut and the hindgut. Therefore, it is supplied by two arteries. The right two thirds are supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. The left one third is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. <coughs> now start by the celiac artery or celiac trunk. This artery, which is a very short trunk. So again, the origin, it arises from the front of the abdominal aorta at the level of the upper border of L1. It is a very short trunk that immediately divides into three branches. The first branch is the smallest branch, this one, is the left gastric artery. Second one is the splenic artery, this one. It runs in a wavy course along the upper border of the pancreas, this is the pancreas, and the third one is the hepatic artery. Again, Celiac trunk or celiac artery, this is the stomach, this is the spleen, this is the liver, and this is the gallbladder, and this is a celiac artery, short trunk, divides into three branches, first one, lift gastric artery, second one, splenic artery, going to the spleen, and the third one, hepatic artery, going to the liver. The left gastric artery gives two branches, esophageal branches to the abdominal part of the esophagus, and gastric branches to the stomach. Splenic artery gives the pancreatic branches along its course to the neck, body, and the tail of the pancreas. At the hilum of the spleen, it divides into splenic branches, five to six which enters the hilum of the spleen to supply the spleen. It gives short gastric branches to supply the fundus of the stomach, 
These branches reach the stomach through the gastrosplenic ligament. It gives also left gastroepiploic artery along the greater curvature of the stomach and anastomosis with the, with the right gastroepiploic artery. Then the hepatic artery, it gives right gastric artery, anastomosis with the left gastric along the lesser curvature of the stomach. It gives the gastroduodenal artery, runs behind the first part of the pancreas. It divides into two branches, right gastroepiploic anastomosis with the left, and the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery supplies the upper half of the duodenum and the anastomosis with the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery, where at the biliary orifice or at the major duodenal papilla. Another branch supplies the angle between the first part and second part of the duodenum, supraduodenal artery. Then two terminal hepatic branches, left branch and right branch to the corresponding globes of the liver. The right branch gives the cystic artery to the gallbladder. Again, this is the celiac artery, it gives us three branches, left gastric artery, this one, along the lesser curvature of the stomach, splenic artery, and hepatic artery. The left gastric artery gives the subgeal branches, okay, to the abdominal part of the esophagus, and the gastric branches to the stomach. Splenic artery gives these short branches, okay, which enter the pancreas, pancreatic branches, and it gives the splenic branches, short gastric arteries to the fundus of the stomach, left gastroepiploic artery, okay, along the lesser curvature of the stomach, gastroepiploic, because it gives gastric branches to the stomach and the epiploic branches to the greater omentum. The hepatic artery, hepatic artery gives, okay, right gastric artery along the lesser curvature of the stomach, gastroduodenal artery, this one, behind the first part of the duodenum, it divides into two branches, right gastroepiploic and the superior pancreatic duodenal artery, right gastroepiploic, superior pancreatic duodenal artery. This artery, the supraduodenal artery, okay, and two terminal hepatic branches, the right branch gives cystic artery. Again, celiac artery, it gives three branches, left gastric artery, splenic artery, and hepatic artery. Left gastric artery gives esophageal branches, and gastric branches. Splenic artery, pancreatic branches to the neck, body and the tail of the pancreas, splenic branches to the spleen, short gastric branches to the fundus of the stomach, and left gastroepiploic artery. The hepatic artery gives right gastric artery, gastroduodenal artery, divides into right gastroepiploic and superior pancreaticoduodenal artery, supraduodenal artery, Two hepatic arteries, the two terminal branches, the right branch gives the cystic artery. That is the supply of the stomach. The stomach is supplied by five arteries. These five arteries are two arteries along the lesser curvature and three arteries along the greater curvature. The two arteries along the lesser curvature, the gastric artery and the right gastric artery. The, two art the three arteries along the greater curvature, short gastric artery, left gastroepiploic artery, and right gastric artery. The left gastric artery arises directly from the celiac artery. The right gastric artery from the hepatic artery, short gastric arteries from the splenic artery, left gastroepiploic from the splenic artery, right gastroepiploic from the gastroduodenal of the hepatic artery. Now the superior mesenteric artery 
it is the artery of the mid gut and the mid gut begins from the biliary orifice or major duodenal papilla in the middle of the second part of the duodenum till the junction between the right two thirds and the left one third of the transverse colon. Okay, the origin it arises from the abdominal aorta, from the front of the abdominal aorta at the level of the lower border of L1 in the transpyloric plane. The course it descends in front of the uncinate process of the pancreas, this is the uncinate process. Then in front of the third part of the duodenum, it enters the root of the mesentery to terminate here in the right iliac fossa by anastomosing with a branch from the iliocolic artery. Branches, it gives five branches. The first branch is this one between the duodenum and the head of the pancreas. It is the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. It supplies the lower half of the duodenum and the anastomosis with the superior pancreatic duodenal artery at the biliary orifice. Second one, this one, the middle colic artery. It enters the transverse mesocolon, divides into left branch and right branch. The middle colic artery supplies the right two thirds of the transverse colon. In this artery, right colic artery, this right colic artery divides into ascending branch and the descending branch, supplies ascending colon. Then iliocolic artery, this iliocolic artery divides into colic branch and the ileal branch. The ileal branch supplies the terminal part of the ileum. The colic branch supplies ascending colon, cecum, and the vermiform appendix. Then these many branches. Jejunal and ileal branches supply the jejunum and ileum. Okay? In the anterior mesenteric artery, or the artery of the hindgut, and the hindgut extends from the junction between right two thirds and left one third of the transverse column to the junction between the upper half and the lower half of the inner canal. Rises from the front of the abdominal aorta at the level of L3 in the subcostal plane. Termination course. Okay. It descends medial to the inferior mesenteric vein and the ureter. It terminates by crossing the left common iliac artery and the superior rectal artery. Branches. Left colic artery. This left colic artery divides into ascending and descending branches. Ascending branch supplies the left, the left third of the transverse colon, left colic flexure, and the descending colon. Okay. Uh, then these two branches, sigmoid branches, are going to the sigmoid colon. and the anastomose with the left colic artery. And then the continuation is the continuation of the inferior mesenteric artery. You see this artery along the margin of the large intestine, which is formed by anastomosis of the colic arteries. Okay, this artery is called the marginal artery. So what is the marginal artery? The marginal artery is the anastomotic artery between the colic arteries along the margin of the large intestine. Now, arterial supply and the lymph drainage of the duodenum. Again, the duodenum is developed from the foregut and the midgut. Therefore, it is supplied by two arteries. The upper half is supplied by celiac artery. The lower half is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. Okay. This is the celiac artery supplying the upper half. This is the superior mesenteric artery supplying the lower half. What are the branches of the celiac artery which supply the upper half of the duodenum? This is the first one supplying the first part of the duodenum. Right gastric artery. This is the second one. 
right gastro epiploid artery okay from the gastro duodenal artery then the one which supplies the angle between first part and second part supraduodenal artery okay and then this artery superior pancreatic duodenal artery the lower half is supplied by only one artery this one the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery therefore at the biliary orifice there is anastomosis between the celiac artery and superior mesenteric artery and it is the anastomosis between superior pancreatic duodenal and the inferior pancreatic duodenal arteries lymph drainage just remove the artery and put lymph nodes so the upper half of the duodenum drains into celiac lymph nodes and the lower half of the duodenum drains into superior mesenteric lymph nodes then the blood supply of the pancreas the pancreas is supplied by the celiac artery except the lower half of the head and the unsinate process are supplied by the superior mesenteric artery again pancreas is supplied by the celiac artery except the lower half of the head and the unsinate process okay this is the landmark between upper half of the head and the lower half of the head and here is the biliary orifice okay superior pancreatic duodenal artery supplies the upper half of the head inferior pancreatic duodenal artery supplies the lower half of the head and the unsinate process and then the neck body and the tail are supplied by the pancreatic branches of the splenic artery okay this is the splenic artery pancreatic branches of the splenic artery then blood supply of the large intestine large intestine supplied by two arteries according to its origin superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery superior mesenteric artery supplies the parts derived from the mid gut inferior mesenteric artery supplies the parts derived from the hind gut and the landmark is here junction between right two thirds of the transverse column and the left one third of the transverse column so superior mesenteric artery supplies the cecum appendix ascending column and the right two thirds of the transverse column inferior mesenteric artery supplies the left third of the transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and the upper half of the inner canal. <coughs> cecum <coughs> is supplied by anterior and posterior cecal arteries from the ileocecal artery. Appendix by the appendicular artery, okay, from the ileocolic artery. Ascending colon, ileocolic, and the right colic from the superior mesenteric artery okay. <laughs> then transverse artery is very important because it has double arterial supply the right to serve the mesenteric artery from the inferior mesenteric artery right to serve superior mesenteric left one third inferior mesenteric descendant to the left colic and the sigmoid branches of the inferior mesenteric artery and sigmoid colon sigmoid branches of the inferior mesenteric artery the lymph branch and the lymph branch correspond to the arteries bye bye baby venous system is formed by the veins draining the gastrointestinal tract and its accessories so it's formed by the portal vein this is the portal vein and the two veins which form the portal vein okay this is a superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein and this vein which drains into the splenic vein which is inferior mesenteric vein inferior mesenteric vein drains the hind gut superior mesenteric vein drains the mid gut <coughs> 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 
talk about the portal vein, origin of the portal vein. Let us see here some landmarks. This is the pancreas, onsenate process, head, neck, body, and the tail. This is the abdominal aorta. This is the superior mesenteric artery in front of the onsenate process, and this is the portal vein. The landmark of the origin is the neck of the pancreas. So behind the neck of the pancreas, it takes origin behind the neck of the pancreas by the union of two veins. Splenic vein and superior mesenteric vein. Okay, so origin of the portal vein behind the neck of the pancreas, union of two veins, splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein. <coughs> this is the portal vein formed by union of splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein. Behind the neck of the pancreas. It terminates as a porta hepatis by dividing into two branches, left branch and right branch. Tributaries six or seven. Okay, of course the first two are the veins which form the portal vein, splenic vein, okay, superior mesenteric vein, and the two veins along the lesser curvature of the stomach, left gastric and right gastric veins, left gastric and right gastric veins, para umbilical veins, cystic vein, okay, cystic vein from the gold bladder, Paraumbilical veins. We can add, actually, this vein, which is the superior pancreaticoduodenal vein. This superior pancreaticoduodenal vein either terminates directly into the portal vein or into the right gastroepiploic vein. The portal vein has a coarse format of three parts. First one behind the first part of the duodenum, second one in the free margin of the lesser momentum, and the third one at the porta hepatis. This is the portal vein behind the first part of the duodenum. We have two structures in front of it separating the portal vein from the first part of the duodenum, the bile duct and the gastroduodenal artery. And behind the portal vein is the inferior vena cava. Therefore, behind the first part of the duodenum, anterior to the portal vein are the bile duct and the gastroduodenal artery. And behind the portal vein is the inferior vena cava. In the free margin of the lesser momentum, in front of the portal vein, the prince and the princess, bile duct, anterior and to the right, Hepatic artery anterior and to the left. Behind the portal vein is the epiploic foramen. This epiploic foramen separates the portal vein from inferior vena cava. At the portal hepatis, where the portal vein divides into two branches, and the hepatic artery divides into two branches, and the bile duct is formed by two ducts. Okay? So two hepatic ducts. Two hepatic arteries are anterior to the portal vein. Again, this is the portal vein. Okay. Termination of the portal vein at the portal hepatis here. It divides into two branches. Left branch and right branch. Left branch enters the left loop. Right branch enters the right loop. The two branches divide into branches, which terminate in liver sinusoids. Liver sinusoids. From the liver sinusoids, two hepatic veins arise, and these two hepatic veins open in the inferior vena cava. So actually, the liver sinusoids are the landmark between 
portal circulation and the systemic circulation. So again, the two hepatic veins terminate in the inferior vena cava. So termination at the portal hepatis divides into left branch and the portal vein and the right branch. Each branch divides into branches which terminate into liver sinusoids. From the liver sinusoids, two hepatic veins arise. These two hepatic veins terminate in inferior vena cava. The left branch of the portal vein is connected with two structures. It is connected with the umbilicus by the ligamentum tears of the liver, and it is connected with the inferior vena cava by the ligamentum venosum. The right branch is connected with the gallbladder by the cystic vein. This is a very important topic. Anastomosis between the portal venous system and systemic venous system. Portal systemic anastomosis. We have six sites. The three main sites are lower end of the esophagus. At the lower end of the esophagus, between esophageal branches of the left gastric vein and the social branches of the azygous vein. At the lower end of the rectum, between the superior rectal vein and the middle and inferior rectal veins, around the umbilicus, between the para-umbilical veins and the superficial veins of the anterior abdominal wall. Another areas, the liver inside the liver, liver sinusoids, the landmark between portal and the venous system, retro bare area of the liver, between the veins of the liver and the phrenic veins, and retro peritoneal, okay, behind the peritoneum, colic veins and abdominal wall veins. Then we'll talk about the clinical importance of this anastomosis. Again, at the lower end of the esophagus, between the subgeal veins of the left gastric vein and the subgeal and the tributaries of the azygous vein, in portal hypertension, this anastomosis is dilated to form subgeal varices and the rupture of the esophageal varices will cause hematemesis, vomiting of blood. Around the umbilicus, between the para-umbilical veins and the superficial veins of the anterior abdominal wall, again, in portal hypertension, this anastomosis is dilated to form dilated tortuous veins around the umbilicus, called the caput medusae. At the lower end of the rectum, between the superior rectal vein, which is portal, and the middle and the inferior rectal veins, which are systemic. Again, in portal hypertension or obstruction of the liver, okay, by liver cirrhosis, this anastomosis becomes dilated, forming the dilated veins at the lower end of the rectum, it's called the piles or hemorrhoids. This is the umbilicus, this is the umbilicus, and these are radiating veins around the umbilicus, giving the picture of Cabot Medusae. Okay. Portal hypertension. Portal hypertension increases the pressure in the portal vein due to liver cirrhosis. So what are the features, the clinical features of portal hypertension? Number one, ascites. Accumulation of excessive serous fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Number two, due to obstruction of the venous drainage from the spleen, the spleen gets enlarged, splenomegaly. Esophageal varices, dilated veins in the lower end of the esophagus, okay, esophageal varices. Cabot medusae, dilated veins around the umbilicus. 
hemorrhoids, internal hemorrhoids, dilated veins, or dilated anastomosis between superior rectal and the inferior rectal and the middle rectal veins. So, portal hypertension might lead to several conditions: ascites, splenomegaly, caput medusae, sphagellar varices, hemorrhoids.